As I watched the news and kept an eye on the social media networks um, this week, I wondered how the passages set for today could possibly help us bring about God's kingdom in a world that seems to have lost the plot. Israel and Palestine are at war, not to mention the war in Ukraine, Central African Republic, the Forgotten War in Sudan, um, and horror of horrors, the very graphic images of people, of minority religious groups being crucified in northern Iraq. What's happened? It's almost um, as if God, if Christ, as if Christ, as if the Holy Spirit has somehow abandoned our world to its own self-destruction. It feels like God isn't really hearing our pleas. All I can hear are the words of the reproaches. If you have a chance to look at it, page 194 of your prayer books, traditionally used on Good Friday. For me, it's as if Jesus is crying out to us instead, saying, My people, what have I done to you? How have I offended you? Answer me. So please enjoy this top Eastern Morcade. Reading the passage of Setka today, I couldn't help but think of Andrew Lloyd Webber's Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Way, way back many centuries ago. Not long after the Bible began, Jacob lived in the land of Canaan. It's one of my favorite, favorite shows. I've never, ever seen it on stage. I've only seen it on film. And I didn't even get to see it when I was at Boys High, because I did it in, I think, the second year when I was at Boys High. In the midst of the story where Jacob sends his favorite son, Joseph, to see how the brothers are getting along, we hear how Joseph's dreams were not received very well. You see, dear friends, diplomacy isn't spelt J-O-S-E-P-H. During the 16th century, I dreamed that in the fields one day the corn gave me a sign. During the 16th century, Your eleven sheaves of corn all turned and bowed to mine. My sheep was not a sight to see, a golden sheep and tall. For a Yours were green and second rate, and really rather small. You can imagine how the eleven brothers felt about that. Then he carries on. I dreamed I saw eleven stars, the sun, the moon, and sky, bowing down before my son. It made me wonder why. Could it be that I was born for higher things than you? A post in someone's government, a ministry, a large local church, or more often, and then they were really incensed. And then Anyone who did this Annette read for us how they plotted. Perhaps Joseph and his brothers could have benefited from the Jesus Lifestyle course, especially this coming week's talk on how to respond to difficult people. Seeking. Searching. Joseph went looking for his brothers. And in today's reading from Genesis, the meaning in Hebrew of Jacob's command to Joseph See how your brothers are could be better translated as seek the peacefulness and integrity of your brothers. Joseph's search for his brothers, God's search for us, our search for one another is more than just to seek and search for another. Rather, it is to seek and search for the other's peace, the other's wholeness, the other's well-being. Something I think people in our world today desperately need to do. We spend so much time fighting each other that we have seem to have lost the value in the other. We seem to have missed 
the image of God in the other, regardless of how they perceive God. As God goes searching, looking for us, so we must look and search for God and for one another, for our brothers and sisters. As Joseph went looking for his brothers, so must we. Now, this story of Joseph is not confined to Christian sacred texts. It is found in the sacred texts of all three Semitic religions. In the Quran, in the Old Testament that the, that the Jewish people use, and in our Christian texts. There's an interesting little thing in this text, in verse 15 of the Genesis passage, we have a little bit of an enigmatic interlude. You know, Joseph's wandering around in the, in the fields and a stranger comes in. There's a stranger. And Hebrew interpretation often asks this, uh, takes this to be an angel of God, who asks Jesus, who are you looking for? Joseph didn't seek on his own, but he sought his brothers with divine guidance. If this stranger's brief encounter had not happened, would Joseph ever have found his brothers so that God's providence could unfold in salvation history? Are we ever a chance encounter for another to find their way to God? Do we listen if God, as the stranger, places guidance in our own path? The Joseph Saga is a story of hatred, prejudice, and blind jealousy. It doesn't begin as a pretty picture. Joseph's brothers want to kill the favored, the beloved brother, and destroy the heart of their father as well as the son. Like the story of our world, it is a violent story. First of murder, then to hide the deed, to throw the beloved down a well, and finally, in a cruel compromise, to sell him into slavery. Then some Ishmaelites, a hairy crew came riding by. I guess you're all going to go and see if you can find Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat on YouTube this afternoon. This story is far more than a tale of family dysfunction, of family hatred and division. It is a story of God's working in the lives of human beings, even human beings that falter, that fail, that sin despicably and so abhorrently. It is a story of divine intervention salvation history and God's provision. The brothers, of course, had no idea that their actions would, at a later stage, lead to their own provision and survival. Their deeds were simply malicious. Yet God, even though the evil, even through the evil of the world, works good and wonder. God is the restorer the one who takes death and transforms it into resurrection. You see, Joseph became an instrument in God's plan of love and provision. It was because Joseph had become successful in Egypt in a position of power and authority that he was able to help his entire family when famine came. It was the kind of help that transcends knowing or transcends anything that we can understand. It is contained in love. It is contained in forgiveness. And it is contained in mercy. God's help came through human hands, human love, human forgiveness. Joseph ultimately was able to overcome the human tendency to judge or reject those closest to him who had wronged him. 
and maybe it is because he was given those dreams. Dear friends, fear is the predominant obstacle to God using us in this world. Fear is the predominant obstacle to our own ability to have faith and trust in God's providential love in the midst of hardships. I kind of spoke about this last week when I got you to respond to God is good. There we go. All the time. Our world, dear friends, is inundated by fear right now. It controls our hearts, it controls our minds, it even controls our behavior. Fear is seen in the crises that cause nations to enact unjust laws. Fear is seen in the way people war against each other, each other instead of making peace. Fear is there when the economy is pressurized by the greed of just a few people. When prices of the very basic necessities of life in the shops rises before our eyes. It is there when we have the threat of a hemorrhagic fever, Ebola, coming to our country. We're so worried about that. Fear is there. Fear is in the illness of those we love or the illness of ourselves. Fear is there in the myriad of broken relationships. The psalmist in Psalm 69, it's not the one set for today, but I thought it would be best to use it, provides us with the words so many must be crying out at the moment. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. In today's gospel passage, we hear the account of Peter challenging Jesus to call him out of the boat and to walk on the water with him. Why? Because he didn't quite believe that Jesus was right there. The disciples were alone in the boat. A terrible storm had arisen. Jesus was walking toward them across the water like an apparition. It's a ghost! They've just spent the day with Jesus. How could it be a ghost? And in some way they were filled with fear. The storm was very, very, very real for them. And in that small boat, they had good reason to be afraid. To see their beloved Jesus walking across the lake in the dark, in the violence of the storm, doing what was humanly impossible, must have been frightening. To try to do what is humanly impossible by ourselves without God's help is always frightening. Peter listens to Jesus say simply, Come! He gets out of the boat in a response that defies all logic. Our boats are symbols of false security, often reflected in our bank accounts, our materialism, and the things that we surround ourselves with. Dear friends, I want to ask you a couple of questions. What is the boat in your life that you are afraid to get out of? My boat I'm afraid to get into, it's called Moonraker. What is the boat in your life that prevents you from following God's call to you when he says, come? God is What is the fear that paralyzes and imprisons you inside the boat? God is at work. Jesus works aside. Dear friends, Peter began to sink after getting out of the boat for one reason and one reason only, and that was fear. He looked around at the worldly reality of the storm, the physics of the water, the incomprehensibility of the situation, the absurdity of it all. 
so when Jesus says fear to him, overwhelmed Peter oh, begins to sink. As he begins to sink, that. he can do he nothing but do what we're all supposed to do when we get into trouble. He cried out, Lord, save me. Lord, save us. Lord, save us all. The epistle to the Romans today gives us the same sort of direction for what we must do to receive that salvation of Jesus. We must ask. We must cry out. Jesus save me. We must believe in our hearts. Really believe that it is Jesus who gives us life. Forever eternal life. And we cry out. We proclaim with our lips. We believe. Proclaim out loud. Jesus is Lord. When we put ourselves before others, dear and friends, then we are blind. We too, dear friends, we can walk on water. To forgive, we are blind. Don't try this at home, your water's when probably too cold in the swimming pool. Instead of what is right, we are blind. The water that tries to drown us, the water of fear that we can rise above, is overcome. Even that storm of the world around us is overcome by the fact that when we call Jesus save me, that Jesus reaches up and pulls us out. In the face of all the horrible things that are happening in the world, the one thing we can hold on to is that Jesus will reach us and pull us out. And who among us has not experienced suffering at one point or another? Let me give you a few. Depression, anxiety, abuse, neglect, broken relationships, illness, lost jobs, fear, grief, hopelessness. I think I could probably go on all morning just giving one after the other. Each one of us can say that in some way one of those things we have experienced. You see, suffering plagues our communities. Suffering plagues our communities in the most astonishing ways. An aeroplane falls out of the sky and disappears with the radar. Their natural disasters, mass shootings and national tragedies. Even our national heroes are put on trial because their lives went to rise somewhere. None of us is immune. Immune, not only. Of course, there are those who will attempt to lull us into believing that faith not only brings an end to suffering and blindness, but that it also makes our hurts and pains disappear. But the hard truth is that this simply isn't so. It's not true. After all, even after the blind man received his sight, he was faced with the rejection of his friends and family, they didn't want to help him because they were scared of the Pharisees. They were still persecuted. They didn't believe him. You see, suffering is painful. Grief is awful, even horrifying at times. But it is an inescapable part of our humanity. The powerful and life-giving truth of the Gospel is that our suffering and grief will not have the last word. As our souls and bodies desperately cry out for relief, especially on Refreshment Sunday, we hear the faint yet clear voice of the risen Christ calling us, reminding us that through the cross, death, and hopelessness, and all its trappings have been swallowed up in victory. The final word rests not with suffering and blindness, but with life and peace. Then we hear those most sublime words imaginable. Go, wash. And as the cool and refreshing waters of life wash over us, our eyes and our hearts are open to behold the living Christ, standing as the chains of death and hopelessness and suffering and 
how do I make broken a distinct? And like with that blind man, we then can cry, Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. So let's do exactly that now. Let's stand as we affirm our faith.